Appreciate y'all being here. Uh, appreciate Sitka putting this on, bringing everybody to town. Here today, you're going to be really lucky to have a guy like Corey Jacobson. And where's Donnie? Donnie is here to keep Corey honest. Uh, uh, he's, 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 oh, yeah, he's pointing to the further in the back. So, with that, I'm going to introduce my buddy Corey Jacobson. He really doesn't need an introduction. Uh, he comes here all the way from Idaho, uh, has been providing content and instruction and education about elk hunting and elk calling for a long time. Uh, what, 10 time world champion or something like that? I guess when you get over five, you just quit counting how many times you've won the world elk calling championship. So uh, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Corey Jacobson. Welcome him to Bozeman. Thank you, Randy. And Thank you guys for being here. This is awesome. We're uh, about, what, two, three weeks out from elk season. Everybody in the back, can you hear okay? Good? All right. Thanks for being here. It's a Saturday. I know Saturdays are precious, especially now. School's starting soon. Elk season's starting soon. There's a lot of things you could be doing. So this is, uh, this is very humbling to uh, see so many of you here. And I hope that I'm able to share a little bit about elk hunting and uh, elk calling specifically today. But more than anything, I just want to share my passion for elk. And that uh, Will Primo said something a few years ago when I was talking to him that sums up everything I do and everything that I feel about elk hunting. And he said, if you teach somebody to love something, they're going to protect it. And that is absolutely, he, he summed it up, but that's been my driving force from the beginning of everything I've done with elk hunting. I just want to share my passion. I want to share why I love elk hunting, which is the calling aspect, but I want others to have that same passion. And so hopefully you feel that today. Hopefully maybe there's something you can learn that makes you a better elk hunter or a better elk caller. But if there's not, just know that we're all in this together. We're all on the same team. We're all elk hunters. And that passion we have unites us and connects us. And we're like two and a half, three weeks away from being able to do what we love to do for a very short period of time each year. So today, I'm grateful. Thank you, Sitka and Sitka Depot, for putting this on, giving me a chance to come and talk about elk and elk calling and uh, just be here mingling and interacting with so many of you like-minded elk hunters. We're going to talk about calling elk in the rut. So when it comes to calling elk, there are a lot of methods, a lot of tactics, a lot of strategies. I don't get so much into explaining a specific strategy or necessarily a how-to, but more a why. Why do elk do what they do? And when we understand why they're doing something, then we can apply it across a, a much broader platform and be able to apply it during different times of the year, different situations. If I said, here is the strategy you want to use to call in an elk, that might work one out of four times, one out of five times, but you're going to get in situations where that doesn't work it's more important to understand why it works and why it doesn't work. Then you can make sure that you've got a strategy that you're able to quickly adjust to and uh, call in elk. We're going to talk about calling elk in different phases of the rut. We're going to talk about those different phases of the rut because elk change from day to day, especially as we're talking the end of August into the first week of September through September, elk are changing. They change what they do. They change how they react to calling. The, the calling strategies that we use are going to change. So we're going to talk about why that changes and how it changes. We're going to talk about some of those situations because of those changes, situations that we're going to face through different times of the rut. So early season, you know, from now until the 1st of September, what's different from then and how we use calls into the pre-rut as they're gathering cows and establishing dominance. And then during the peak rut, it changes from day to day in each of those different phases, there's changes and different strategies. We talk about just some basic calling, you know, just the very basics of calling, not getting into doing a bunch of different sounds, but what is it that makes calling work? Why do elk respond to calls and how can we make sure that we're implementing that into our calling so that we get the most efficiency in those responses? And then just a couple things at the end that I think really add to the effectiveness of calling elk. And they gave me a clicker here that's got two green buttons. One is a really cool laser and the other goes forward. So going forward, we've got three phases of the rut. We've got the early season, we've got the pre-rut, and then the peak rut. So early season 
as we talk about that, you know, it's, it's general. So keep in mind, I'm not gonna say from August 27th through September 5th, this is early season, those are guidelines and generalizations. Same with the pre-rut, same with the peak rut. It's not gonna hit at the exact same time in different areas, in different years. So as we talk about that, keep in mind, it is a, a generalization. I'm gonna talk about what elk, specifically bull elk, are doing through each of those phases. And then we're gonna talk about how we can use calls to be most effective as we're trying to call in elk in each of those phases. So, we've got three pictures here, hopefully illustrating the different phases of the rut. So over here, I'm gonna use my, look at that. Over here, we've got a bull by himself, and that describes the early season. So from right about now, I've spent the last three days scouting for elk, and I've seen a lot of single bull tracks the last three days. So they're breaking up from their bachelor groups right about now. They're moving off into what I call staging areas, so they're solo. And I'm talking mature bulls. Some of the younger bulls are still gonna be with other bulls. They might even be hanging around with cows, but those bigger mature bulls that are gonna be herd bulls right now are moving off by themselves. Their testosterone levels are coming up. They don't want company. They're very irritable. And every day between now and about September 2nd or 3rd, they're gonna become more and more irritable, less and less likely to be around another elk. They don't want company. They've spent all summer, they've been buddies, but now they don't want anything to do with those other bulls. And so they move off by themselves in an area where they rake trees, they strengthen their neck muscles, they aren't moving very much right now. They're gonna bed down on a bench on a north face. They might move out 300 yards to feed in the evening and go right back to that bench to bed down. They've got water close by, they usually aren't traveling very much. But again, keep in mind that they're solo and they're getting more and more irritable every day. Next phase is the pre-rut. This is when the bulls leave those staging areas and they start looking for cows. So we're talking September 3rd, 4th, 5th, somewhere in there through about the 14th, 15th. These bulls are starting to wander. The big bulls are going out. They aren't necessarily grouping up with the cows yet. They aren't establishing a harem, but they're looking to see where the cows are. And they're, they're on the move. So you're gonna see a lot of single bull tracks during this time. And that's the first part of the pre-rut. As we go into the second part of the pre-rut, it is when they're starting to mix in with the cows. They're starting to fight. They're starting to bugle a lot more. They're displaying dominance and they're establishing that pecking order. And then we go into the peak rut. And that is when the bulls have the cows. They've established their harems. They've established who the herd bulls are and they're focused on breeding. The cows are coming into estrus and they're starting to focus on breeding. So as we talk about those three phases, you see that the, the activity and the actions of the bull elk are changing quite rapidly, sometimes overnight. You've got a bull in a staging area by himself. He's there for maybe two to three weeks, and then he just gets up overnight and he starts traveling. He might go five, six miles to get to where the cows are. He might go a half a mile and he's into the cows. He might go by 10 different herds of cows to go to a little herd of three cows that's six miles away. I have no idea why they do it. I've seen bulls in a bachelor group in the summer, six bulls that end up 12, 13 miles away from each other during the rut. And then after the rut, they come back together in November, December, and they hang out the same bulls year after year, but they split up and go completely different ways. They go right by some big herds of cows to go to a little group of cows. There's, I have no explanation for it. Just know if you're watching a herd of bulls in the summer, they're usually not gonna be in the same place during the, the middle of September. They're gonna move looking for those cows. And then once they find the cows, they establish their dominance and they focus on breeding. One thing I do wanna look at real quickly as we talk about 2023 in September, as we break down early season, we're talking everything up to about the second or third of September. So from now until the second or third of September, we're talking early season. As we get into the pre-rut, probably the fourth through about the 17th, 18th, somewhere in there is going to be the pre-rut. And again, there's a first phase of the pre-rut where the big bulls are wandering. And then the second phase of the pre-rut, they find the cows and they start establishing dominance. And then everything from the 18th, 19th, 20th on is gonna be considered peak rut. That's when the bulls are herded up. That's when the cows are coming into estrus and they're actually doing the breeding. So, Keep in mind, moon phase plays a, a little bit of a, an important part of when we hunt strictly based on an elk's activity. It doesn't change the rut necessarily, but 
if the bulls have a full moon, they're going to be more active at night. They're going to be out longer at night rutting, which means they're going to be less active during daylight hours. So that last week of September, the rut's going to be going crazy probably, but it's going to be a little bit more difficult because the bulls are going to be spending more energy at night, more time bedded down during daylight hours. So if I was to pick a, a prime week this year, you've got two options probably. That 9th through the 16th is going to be incredible, and then the 16th through the 23rd is going to be really good. The last week's going to be awesome as well. They're, they're still going to rut. They're elk. They aren't going to change their behavior as far as the rut goes because of the moon, but they're going to be less visible, less time out and active during daylight hours. So moving on from that, early season elk. So I used to really like hunting early season, like September 1st through the 10th. That was a, a fun time to hunt because the big herd bulls are by themselves. Once they get herded up, you've got all those eyes and ears of a, a herd of cows that are protecting that bull. But when he's by himself, he's vulnerable and he's irritable. So we talked about the fact that testosterone is building in them. They're strengthening their neck muscles for the sole purpose of fighting. So you see a bull, you know, in the middle of July, he's got a skinny little neck. And then you see him in the middle of September and his neck is like a barrel. That's to protect him. As they get in fights, they know that they're gonna be crashing antlers and heads and their neck's gonna snap if it isn't strengthened. So they spend that pre-season or the early season strengthening their neck by raking trees. And if you get into a staging area, you'll notice there are 20, 30 trees in the, in the space of this room that are all rubbed up. That's a staging area. If you see that and you think this is where they're gonna rut, look at all these rubs, they might be 10 miles away from there when they're actually rutting. That's where they're gonna stage early season. And they're just doing that to build up build up their energy, build up their neck muscles, testosterone's building until it finally snaps and it says, go and find the cows. During that time, they do not want company. So if I'm hunting elk early season, and I wanna target a big bull, he's susceptible to calls. Now, put it into human terms. If you're thinking about human psychology, you've got a, a wise person who's not easily drawn to anger and fighting that wants to be left alone. What buttons are you gonna push to get that bull to wanna to come in and fight you. If you're back 400 yards away and you're bugling your head off, he's ignoring it. You get inside 100 yards, now you're in his territory. He doesn't want you there. He doesn't want company, he just wants left alone. He's probably gonna be more likely to say, hey, get out of here, you're too close to me. And when you keep pushing it and pushing it, he's gonna snap and that's when he comes in. And we've had some of the most insane, intense, uh, just rut crazed activity August 30th, August 31st, September 1st, on these big lone bulls. And they are so susceptible to calls during that time because they don't have the cows there to protect them. They, have, they aren't chasing cows, they aren't moving, they're in their territory, in their area. And if you can get in there and push that button, you can get a big bull to come walking right into a shooting lane. So early season, as we're looking at that, keep in mind, these bulls are by themselves, the bigger bulls. If you get a big bull bugling, you know, he might do a location bugle or answer a location bugle from 300 yards away one time, and then he won't bugle again the rest of the morning. You might only get one bugle out of that bull right at daylight during that time. That's all you need. Then get in close, then you can use the calls. But keep in mind what their attitude is, what their mental state is during that time, okay? Think about that every phase of the rut as you're calling. They're gonna be different you know, points in what they're feeling, what they're wanting, what they're needing. As we're talking calling strategies here, the best thing you can do if you get that bull to respond is get in close to him. Just go quiet in there. He's just laying there, he's not moving, he's not expecting company, and then you surprise him with a bunch of aggression. He doesn't want that when he's close. He doesn't have a place to go. He doesn't have a place to retreat to. This is his bedroom. And he doesn't have a place lined up to go with, you know, when the cows later, when you get in there and you're aggressive, and you've got a herd of elk and the cows decide to leave, the bull's gonna follow them. Well, he doesn't have anywhere to go right now. He's not anticipating somebody coming in there and getting aggressive in his bedroom. So when you do, his only option is to come in and fight, come in and, and challenge, come in and push you out of his bedroom. So the top line here, the surprise aggression, that's for a herd bull. Down below, this is for a younger bull. And completely different, again, the mentality, a younger bull, during this time, he's like, hey, all my friends just left me. I've spent all summer with this group of elk, and now they all left me, and I'm by myself. What's, what's a young bull thinking? I just want company. Where's mom? Where's the family? You know, I, I don't want to be by myself. So they're really susceptible to finding a herd. 
So if you get in an area where there are younger bulls and it's early season, I'm gonna set up in an area where I've got good thermals, I've got a good setup, and then I'm just gonna do some simple calling, some cow calls, maybe a little bugle squeal, and that bull's probably not gonna be talking during early season. You probably aren't gonna have him screaming at you, those younger bulls, he's probably gonna come in quiet looking for that herd. But he's coming in, guard down, nobody's been chasing him all summer, no predators, you know, two-legged predators chasing him. He's not anticipating those cow sounds that he hears are danger. He's just coming, walking in there, wanting to be a part of that herd. He's desperate for company during this time because he's all by himself and he doesn't like that. So as we're thinking calling strategies, be aggressive when you get close, surprise the big bull. If you're trying to target a smaller bull, you know there's a smaller bull or a couple smaller bulls in the area. Some just general timid herd talk is gonna be effective. As we go into the pre-rut, okay, so this is the time when the bull, the big bulls start wandering. A lot of times during this time, the younger bulls are with the herd. They've teamed up, they found the cows. Sometimes even these five points, small six points, think that they're the herd bull during this time. They might even get a little bit aggressive and think, yeah, look at what I've got. I've got a herd of seven or eight cows right here. I'm the big guy on the mountain now. And they get a little bit of a sense of false uh, security and strength there until the big bulls come in. But also keep in mind, during that time, these younger bulls might be with the cows and are they gonna be as apt to come in and fight? No, they want to save their cows. They want to preserve them. They know if they come in and fight a bigger bull, they might lose them. So you're going to get these younger bulls with the herds that really aren't aggressive coming in to protect that herd. Then you've got the big bulls out there that are starting to get aggressive. They're wandering. They're looking for the herds. And then that transitions into sometime around the 8th, 9th, 10th through the 14th. So that second full week of season this year is going to be prime time for these bulls establishing their dominance. That's when they want to fight. That's when they, you know, sometimes they'll just square up and, and face off with each other and they just, you know, they say, that's the big bull, I'm not going to mess with him. But this is when they're fighting. This is when they're saying, I think I'm going to challenge the herd bull this year. I'm going to go in there and prove to him that I'm worthy of these cows. They're literally fighting. They'll, they might go and fight and then they get beat and they'll go clear over to another drainage and look for a bull to fight there, trying to establish that dominance. So for me, this is probably my favorite time to hunt now. When those bulls are not completely herded up, they're not completely locked in on a harem, they don't have cows that are ready to be bred necessarily, they're trying to establish who's the toughest bull. If you're trying to call in an elk and be aggressive, this is the time that you want to do it. As that transitions into the picra and when they get established with cows, it can be a lot more difficult. You're going to hear more bugles, but you're going to have a more difficult time getting those elk to come to you, leave their cows and come into a calling setup. So pre-rut, these bulls are out, they're searching for cows, they're establishing dominance. So aggressive bugling works great for the bigger bulls. They're, they're used to that, that's what they want. They wanna be challenged, they wanna show, they wanna assert their dominance. But the younger bulls, what's happening to them right now? They're the ones that are getting beat up. They've been with the cows, the big bulls come in and they say, nah, not this year, buddy. And they run them off. And most of the time they don't even have to fight. They just show up and the younger bulls are like, I know I'm gonna get beat up. So they're out there, they've been with these cows, they've got all worked up, they think the rut's about to start, and now the rug gets pulled out from under them. So what are they thinking? I need a lonely cow, that's all I need. I don't wanna fight, I don't want a big bull, I don't want aggressive bugling, but if, man, if I hear a cow off by herself that doesn't have a bull with her, that's, a, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So if a younger bull, if you've got a younger bull in the area and you get aggressive bugling, he might not come in. He might not even answer that. But if all he hears is this lonely cow coming up the ridge there, he's probably going to come in. It might be quiet. He might bugle and say, hey, I had a herd of cows and now I have none. I'd like to have at least one. And he comes into that. And as we transition into the herd bulls establishing their harems, they are locked in on their cows. They get cows coming into estrus daily for 10 days, 12 days there. It can be really hard to go in there and be a single cow calling to this bull and saying, hey, leave your group of 30 cows and come into me, this one cow. It can also be really hard to challenge him and say, here I am 200 yards away with a couple cows. I'm really aggressive as a, as a bugling bull. Why is he going to leave and come in and fight? He's already established dominance. He has his harem. If you want to challenge that bull, you've got to get in close to him, put pressure on him and on his herd to get him to break loose and come in. So I have hybrid shadowing, and let me explain what, what I think that is or what, how we utilize that. Shadowing a herd is when you don't use calls at all. So you've got a, a bull that's vocal, he's got cows, and all you're doing is basically on the move, following him, 
getting in as close as you can, setting up and waiting for him to make a move, whether he pushes a cow in front of you, whether you find out where he's going and you cut him off, but you aren't using calls at all, you're letting him talk, you're utilizing that location to get in close and set up. So the hybrid calling, or the hybrid shadowing, utilizes calling in a two-person setup. So you've got a caller back behind that's doing calling just literally to keep that bull vocal. He's not moving in on him, he's not putting pressure on him, he's not trying to call that bull in because calling in a herd bull during the last week of September can be tough. What he's doing is just keeping that bull talking so that the shooter can be dynamic and be moving in, shadowing that herd. So it just adds a calling element to it because you know how it is, the last week of September, there are some bulls that just don't talk much. And so as you're trying to follow him, all of a sudden he bugles, he's 400 yards up the hill, you start moving up there, slipping in quiet, watching everything's quiet, spot and stock type of hunting, and you get up there and he bugles and he's 400 yards over here, and it's like, ah, oh, he's over there now. He's on the move. If you have somebody back calling that can just keep tabs on it, you can kind of figure out where he's going and have a lot better chance of getting in close. So that works really good during that last week of season. And then for the younger bulls, think about what they're, what they're going through. They've been beat up. They've been, this is, you know, a rut for a younger bull, like a 16, 17 year old teenager. Okay, he doesn't know how to treat women. He doesn't know anything other than he's got all this testosterone. He has all of these desires, but he has nowhere for all of that energy to go. So he's desperate at this time. Those younger bulls have been beat up. They've been kicked out, but he wants, wants a cow to hang out with. And so some just desperate cow calling. Estrus buzzing, a cow that's in estrus that needs a bull. Just a, a cow that's by herself that wants, that's lonely. Portray that and those younger bulls are gonna be really susceptible during the peak of the rut. So I've talked a little bit about situations, the, the mental state and the, cycle, the, the psychology of elk during the different phases. So how do we use calls? You know, we talked about we need to portray aggression or we need to portray a desperate cow or a lonely cow. So how do we do that? There's been a lot said, uh, a lot of videos talking about language. You know, you need to learn to respond with this sound. You know, a chuckle means this, or a squeal means this, or a growl means this. And I've spent a lot of time listening to elk, learning elk vocalization. And I have seen big bulls during the peak of the rut that only chuckle. I've seen big bulls during the peak of the rut that don't make a sound. I've seen little bulls during the peak of the rut that sound like an absolute giant herd bull. I've seen little bulls that growl. I've seen big bulls that growl. And they all are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to communicate something, but they do it with different sounds. The thing that they have in common, though, is the emotion that they put into it. So if you think from a, a standpoint of why do calls work on elk? Why does an elk respond to a call? There's two reasons, really. A cow call is going to elicit a reaction out of a bull because he thinks that he either needs to establish a herd and there's a cow there that could be a part of his herd or there's a cow there that's ready to be bred and whether he has cows or not, he may be interested in that single cow because on that day at that time, she's ready to be bred. That's why cow calls work for bigger bulls. For younger bulls, they're a herd animal. They like company. So early in the season, he hears just a regular cow mew. He's thinking, there's company, I can go hang out with that herd. Later on when he gets desperate and he hears a lonely cow, he's coming in because he thinks he has a chance to breed. So that's how cow calls work. That's what they're thinking. That's why cow calls will bring a bull in. When it comes to bugles, a location bugle will get a response out of a bull. Long ways away, you bugle, a bull answers it. All they're doing is saying, hey, I'm up here. Cool, good to meet you, I'm over here. You know, maybe we saw each other this summer and we're keeping tabs on each other. All they're doing is communicating their location with that. But if you want to call a bull in with bugles, you've got to make him want to fight. And that's why they're coming into bugles. When another bull comes into another bull's bugle, it's to establish dominance or to fight. And you've got to make him want to fight. If you're standing at 300 yards from a bull and he's out there and he lets out a bugle, and you wait three minutes and you give him a bugle and it's just a regular doodle 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 It doesn't communicate anything. That's just communicating your location and it's not giving him a reason to come in. So if you wanna get in a fight with an elk, which is what you wanna do when you're bugling, you've gotta portray that, you've gotta to communicate to that bull, I wanna fight you. And there's a reason I wanna fight you and I want you to come into me, you've gotta issue that challenge. So the emotion that goes into calling 
I'm going to do some demonstrating here. I want everybody to close your eyes and I want you to listen to this bugle. I see you peeking. Eyes closed. Okay, did you hear that? Now I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to listen to this bugle. What was the difference in that? Aggression. Aggression, emotion, right? So if there's a bull 300 yards away from me and I want to get in a fight with him, is this going to work? <laughs> What'd you just tell him? <laughs> right? I mean, you told him everything he needed to hear. That bull is not aggressive, he's not challenging me, he sounds terrible, he's, there's no way he's going to get any cows, I'm not going to go in there and even give him the time of day. What are you drinking out of? Yeah, exactly. Okay? But if you get inside 100 yards from a bull, and he doesn't know that you're there, he doesn't know there's another bull there, you know he's 100, 120 yards, 150 yards, whatever it is, close as you can get to him, he doesn't know you're there and he hears this. What's he thinking? There's a cow there. Yeah, exactly. There's a cow. Is he interested in cows during September? Yeah. Yeah. So what's he probably going to do? He might come in and check it out and see if it's a cow. Or he might be like, I'm kind of lazy. I'm just going to let out a bugle and let her come into me. Right? So he gives a bugle. All he thinks is, there's a cow there. Thank goodness. This is a gift from the elk heavens. I'm just sitting here minding my own business and all of a sudden this really sweet sounding cow just shows up here in my bedroom. I'm going to bugle and we're going to hang out and be friends here for a couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden he hears this at 100 yards away. What's his first thought? I don't know what's going on down there, but if that cow's hanging out with him, I don't want to hang out with her. I don't know what she did to deserve that or what she did to what he did to get her to hang out with him, but there's something goofy going on down there. I'm just going to mind my own business. But he's got his hopes up here. He hears this sweet sounding cow and all of a sudden he hears this from 100 yards away. He's just been challenged. Okay, he thinks there's this lady up there all by herself. He just innocently says, hey, you sound really cute. And before he even finishes hitting on her, this other bull that he doesn't even know is there is spitting venom in his face. And he's saying, ah, this is my cow. You stepped out of line here. And he's thinking, but I'm in my bedroom. You came into my room and now you're challenging me, telling me not to talk to your cow that way. He loses it. He doesn't even think about danger. There's just something inside him that trips. He's been challenged. He's coming in. Okay, so you've got to put that emotion into it. And it, you don't have to be a great caller. It doesn't have to be a picture-perfect bugle. Just blow so hard on that bugle that you're communicating aggression and anger. You're calling him names. You are telling him, you just talked to my, my cow. And that's not okay. Think about a human. Okay, think about a human. If you're 300 yards away, and there's somebody walking down the street, and they say, I really don't like that guy. Are you going to sprint across the street 300 yards and just start swinging at him? No. no. You walk around a corner, and you don't know anybody's there, and you walk around the corner, and all of a sudden, right in your face, there's a guy screaming at you, insulting you in front of your girlfriend, telling you that you don't deserve her, that she is way too good for you that you are ugly and scrawny and nobody likes you, what's your first reaction going to be? You aren't going to run, right? He's in your face. There's danger right there. It's fight or flight. And in this situation, you don't have a choice. It's fight. Elk are the same way. You get close, don't give him a choice to run away. Hammer him with surprise aggression 
and he's gonna wanna fight. And those are some of the most insanely addictive situations and experiences you will ever experience in the elk woods. When that elk's coming down the hill and all he can think about is ripping trees out of the ground between you and him, eyes rolled back, snot dripping out of his nose, he can't control what's happening right now. All he is seeing is red. And he's looking for that bull that just challenged him in his bedroom. You can't stop that bull from coming into a shooting lane. Best thing you can do is try to stop him when he gets in a shooting lane because sometimes there's nothing even going to stop him. A cow call, anything, he'll go right through that shooting lane because he's so locked in on that bull that just challenged him. But you have to put that emotion into it. Same with cow calls. There's some really pretty sounding cow calls. And that's great if you're trying to talk to a young bull and you're trying to communicate to that young bull, hey, there's just a herd of cows up here. That's all it takes, just some simple cow calls. But if you're wanting to communicate a lonely, desperate cow, put that into it. What's it gonna sound like when a cow is really lonely and she's like, I need the attention of a bull right now. I need to be with a bull. It's a natural thing that they need to breed. They want to have a bull there. They know that they need to breed. What's that gonna sound like? Is it gonna be a cow that sounds like this? <laughs> no, that's not what a cow that wants to breed is going to sound like. She's going to be loud, she's going to be obnoxious, and she's going to be lonely and desperate. You're going to draw it out a little bit more. It's going to be louder. They're going to be pleading for that bull to come in. So put that emotion into it. Don't worry about hitting all the right notes or sounding just perfect. Just put that emotion into your calling, whether it's a bugle, whether it's a cow call, and that's gonna make a huge difference in the reaction that you get out of elk. So he talked about, you know, the bull's attitude. It's important to understand what his attitude is. So during early season, you've got a bull, a herd bull that is irritable and by himself versus a younger bull that's gonna be a little bit timid. It's gonna be a little bit, you know, lonely. He doesn't want to breed yet. He's not looking for a cow to breed. He's just looking for some company because he's a herd animal. And now all of a sudden, all these other bulls left him and he's standing there by himself going, I don't feel real comfortable right now. I'd feel comfortable if I had some friends around. So that's what we're looking at there. When we move into the first part of the pre-rut, we've got a, a bull, a herd bull that's pretty aggressive. He is still by himself, not herded up. And we've got a younger bull that might be with the herd and he's a little bit timid knowing that if a big bull comes in and catches him with the herd, he's probably gonna get beat up. As we transition in the second part of the pre-rut, we've got a bull that's now starting to establish dominance in a, in a harem. He's starting to, to get with the cows and protect his harem from other bulls. And then we've got a young bull that now has just been ran off from the herd. He's out there by himself, he just got beat up. He's probably not gonna be willing to just come in and wanna fight. We've got to think about his person or his attitude during that time. And then during the peak rut, we've got a bull that's only focused on breeding. A herd bull, that's his whole focus during the peak rut. So if you think you can just walk in and blow a couple cow calls and give him a, a fluty bugle, it's not, going to, it's not going to work. You aren't going to turn a herd bull to come in there. But if you get close to him, put some pressure on him, make him feel like you're in there putting pressure on him and his cows and that you might be a threat to his cows, then he might turn around and come in and, and challenge you. But you've got a young bull now that's by himself and he is desperate. So a, a lonely cow call, a desperate cow call. So there's not necessarily in all of this uh, a set strategy that I want to make sure you understand that, hey, you've got to do this. This is the call you want to make. Three chuckles, a growl, a burp, and a glunk, and then let out a bugle. That's not at all what's going to work to call in that bull. But if you understand what that bull is thinking, what he's feeling, and what he's needing at that time, you're going to have a lot better chance of calling in that bull with whatever you throw at him, knowing the, the aggression you need to put into it, knowing the emotion you need to put into it. If he's looking for a cow and he's a young bull, don't scream an aggressive bugle at him. Give him the cow call. If it's during the peak of the rut and you know that this young bull is just out of his mind, delirious, wanting to breed a cow, give him a lonely cow call. Give him an estrus buzz. Estrus buzz is just a cow call that the cows do when they're by themselves and they know, hey, the window's open, I need bread in the next 24 hours and I don't have a bull here. I am desperate, I need a bull here. I need them to know that I need them here right now. 
and it's just a, a cow call. I'll use, I can use my voice. I can use just my fingers and, and blow into it the lip ball basically for a cow call. And it's going to sound like this. That's what a cow is going to sound like when she needs a bull, when she is ready to be bred. You can do it with your voice. It's just that growly kind of desperate sound. Again, emotion. You're putting emotion into it. Bulls understand what that cow is trying to say. So that can be really effective late in the season, especially for a satellite bull, to get them to come in because they're thinking, there's not a bull with that cow. She's by herself. This is my chance. I'm gonna run in. All right, so a couple things when we talk about calling. I'm gonna, I'll go over some more calling, um, but a few things that really are important to understand. If you are 400 yards away from a bull and you do a calling sequence, whether it's cow calls, whether it's bugles, challenge bugle, whatever it is, he's gonna be a completely different animal when you do the exact same thing from 150 yards away. So I get really aggressive trying to get as close as I can before I even set up and start calling. If I can get inside 150 yards, my, my confidence in calling in just about any bull goes way up. From 300 or 400 yards, it's like, well, if he's in the right mood and it's the right bull on the right day and I give him the right call, he might come in. And there's, you know, there's times when I have to set up there because there's a draw between us. And if I go down, the wind's gonna be different. So there's times when I'm locked in and I can't get any closer. Those times are gonna be a lot less effective than when I can get inside 150 yards. If I can get inside 150 yards on a bull, it doesn't matter if he wants to hear a cow, if he wants to be challenged, everything that I give him from a calling perspective is gonna be much more effective. So the closer you can get before you set up and start calling, the better chances you're gonna have of calling that bull into you. Another thing that I really like to add to any calling sequence is raking. And I've actually found areas where calling is pretty ineffective, whether it's because there's a bunch of wolves in the area and the elk are very uh, wary about being vocal, whether it's uh, because bulls have been pressured by hunters for four straight weeks and they just, they know the game and if they bugle, it might be danger, so they just aren't taking a chance, so maybe they bugle and they run. Raking completely changes the game. Raking's a display of dominance. So during the early season when the bulls are in their staging areas by themselves, they're raking to build neck muscles, but as they transition into, they've got their, their herds established, they've established dominance, raking's a way to show their dominance. And so when you're calling, when you're set up and calling to a bull, if you start raking a tree, that bull says, he's challenging me. Without even bugling, he hears that and he's like, he's trying to say he's the dominant bull here. And a lot of times a bull will start raking then as well to display his dominance back. If you hear a bull start raking, perfect time to move in on that bull. You can get 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, 100 yards closer sometimes. As long as you hear that bull raking, it's a great opportunity for you to move in closer. And the closer you can get to the bull, the better chance you're gonna have at an opportunity for a shot. The other thing is a lot of times calling back and forth, you just can't break that bull loose. Even a bull, a herd bull with cows, they're tough to call in and he won't break loose. But when you start raking a tree, he's like, hold on, I'm the dominant bull here. I'm the herd bull. And a lot of times they'll leave cows and come in, especially during that second part of the, the pre-rut into the first part of the peak rut, they'll still leave their cows and raking's a great way to get them to break loose, to challenge them in addition to the challenging with the calls. And then the other one is before you go through the effort of hiking into an area, getting all the way in there, finding a bull that's bugling, and then calling that bull in to 20 yards, make sure you're in a good setup. There's nothing more frustrating than everything working out, except you set up in the middle of a patch of alder trees, and you can't see more than five or six yards in any direction. That bull's standing there at 18 yards broadside, and you come to full draw three times, and there's not a shooting lane anywhere. Make sure before you even set up and start calling, you've got a place where the bull's gonna feel comfortable coming in, where you've got a game trail coming down there, the thermals are good, and you've got shooting lanes in multiple directions. So when that bull does come in, you have the best opportunity, the most efficient chance of getting a shot at that bull. And that's, you know, I think if there was a t-shirt about all the mistakes we make, about all the excuses why we don't fill our elk tag during a season, most of them are gonna center around that setup. 
I set up my hindbrush and the bull came in. The bull stopped behind a tree. The bull, you know, saw me draw my bow. I was trying to range the bull as he was coming in. Think about all these things that can go wrong in that setup and then avoid as many of them as you can because there's a hundred things that go wrong or can go wrong every time we try to call in a bull. And all we're trying to do is minimize as many of those as we possibly can to stack the odds in our favor when we're trying to call in an elk. These three things, I think, do more to stack the odds in our favor than about any other tactic. And then to, to finalize everything, the most important thing I can share with you when it comes to calling an elk or hunting elk is pay attention to the wind. Everything that an elk does is around surviving and they utilize their nose more than any other sense to stay alive. And they are not ever going to let down their guard more than one or two times in a season. Even a, a bull that is just out of his mind rut crazed, you've got two or three days there where he might come running in not thinking about the wind. But outside of that, they're spending every minute of every day all year long trying to survive. And they do that by using the thermals and their nose. And that's a deadly combination that's really hard for us to get around. You might be able to take a chance and fool them once in a while, or you might be able to get away with inconsistent winds. But the most important thing you can do is learn the thermals, learn the winds, and then use them to your advantage. So that bull still comes in thinking he's protected, but you're also protected and he's not gonna be able to smell you. So thermals are a vital part of any setup and any successful elk hunt.